on to the business at hand. Last night was wonderful, wasn't it? Yes. yes. And being at Bulgari was fantastic and seeing all of the fabulous jewels and accessories and accoutrements. But Bulgari is responsible also for a total environment. And that includes scent, fragrance, something we've been keenly interested in exploring and something that we have the great honor of celebrating um, or being part of the celebration of today, which is the 20th anniversary of Eau Parfumé au Thé Vert. Um, the two people who will be in conversation about this scent are Chandler Burr, who is, I will just be very brief, a, a journalist, an author, and a curator of olfactory art. Please read his full bio in the brochure, but I do want to let you know that two of his the two volumes, The Perfect Scent and The Emperor of Scent, are um, for sale out there, and I hope I'm not taking a liberty, but I'm sure that Chandler would be thrilled to inscribe them for you. So, um, and then um, we are absolutely delighted that um, he will be in conversation with Veronica Bulgari, who oversees special projects for Bulgari. Prior to assuming this role, since 1991, she held managerial positions within the company's jewelry and fragrance divisions. So, this scent was created um, as a gift for special clients, and the rest is history, present and future, which are two distinguished um, interlocutors, if you will, will discuss. And please feel free after to come up and look at these beautiful, uh, not only does it smell wonderful, but there is such a perfect attention to detail in the packaging, in the bottling, and so on and so forth. So we encourage you to come up and look after at the product as well. And of course, Bulgari has generously provided um, a uh, thé vert for each of you, and it's in a beautiful black bag, so that goes along with our red bag. A little touch of Stendhal. So now... Um, can you hear me? Yes? Okay. We're mic'd. I say something. Hello. Um, you hear? We sound sort of not really mic'd. We're mic'd? Fabulous. Wow. That's, that's, a quality, um, that's a quality system. Um, thank you all for, for being here. We're thrilled. Uh, Veronica and I are, are, are excited to be here. And I came into this in a, in a probably the best way that one could possibly come into it, uh, Eau de Thé Vert was introduced to me by its creator, Jean-Claude Elena. And I, um, I had written a book called The Emperor of Scent, and my agent very intelligently sent it to David Remnick at The New Yorker. And David said, um, oh, we're fascinated by this. We want you to write a piece on perfume. Well, I'd never really sort of thought about perfume before. Um, and so I said, well, OK. And he said, we were fascinated by the fact that there are people called perfumers who actually make perfumes to which you can only reply, well, how the hell did you think that they were made? And he said, well, that's, but that's the thing. You know, you imagine Donna Karen pouring rose into, into Jasmine in her, in her bathroom. And are you turned on? That's on the top. It's right here. On, other way. There we are. And, um, and so, and, the, and I was lucky enough, he said, we want you to write about the creation of a perfume, and I got Jean-Claude Elena. Jean-Claude is known for uh, his, he's astonishing, he's one of the greatest olfactory artists of the late 20th and early 21st centuries, and he is creating a, uh, a body of work that uh, is, is extraordinary because it is, it is something that nobody else has done, no other perfumer has done this. He is doing something that I, I uh, term luminism in scent. And he does it with uh, new molecules, absolutely extraordinary synthetics, beautiful, beautiful synthetics, just, just wonderful molecules that are able to give him art. Is, let's remember this art is artificial in the best possible sense. Okay? It has to be artificial. It has to, the artist has to make you feel something, make you perceive the world differently, give you an emotion. All right? 
and force you to see things from his perspective. And that's what Jean-Claude did. And of all his great luminist works, this was the first one. And Jean-Claude was very, and his wife, Suzanne, who's wonderful, were very interested in the idea of tea. And uh, were looking for somebody who understood that. And what was very, very interesting was that Bulgari came, he had actually sketched out a tea. But, and this is the crucial part, this is not tea in any sort concept of. Concept of tea. It's a concept of tea, right. yes. And it was very difficult, and he actually took it, and I, I'm sure I told you that I don't think, I don't know if we put this in the book. I just uh, wrote with, uh, with Bulgari, with um, Veronica and Dana, I wrote, Dana Capone, I wrote uh, a booklet with them, and it was wonderful, and we had a great time doing it. And one of the interesting things was that uh, Bulgari had the idea of doing this as a beautiful gift, and you're going to talk about that in a second. But uh, they went to, Elena had taken his tea to several other people, and there had been absolutely no comprehension of it at all. None. They said, oh, it's not like normal perfume. It's not like, you know, what, you know, what is it? What does it represent? It's not, it's not. And then they would name literal things. You know, it's not myrrh. It's not wood. It's not, well, and he said, but that's the point. And Bulgari had the idea of doing it, and he brought it to them. And it is the first great work of olfactory art that is truly and thoroughly luminous. This is a work that is filled with light. I don't mean light in terms of heavy or not. I mean light in terms of luminosity. And it is an extraordinary scent. It is brilliantly, and anybody who's, who's bought a, a perfume that's less expensive will tell you this, it is beautifully constructed. It stays on skin. It, which is very, very difficult to do, especially with these materials. The, the structure is perfect. Technically, it's perfect. The diffusion is perfect. It's one of the greatest works of olfactory art ever created. And they brought it to Bulgari. And there you go. So back in uh, 1993, I was, I should not reveal my age, but I will. I was 29 years old. <laughs> And um, I was working uh, in the company, and I was going, I had worked for a PR a part of the business, and then I was actually on the sales floor. And at the time, uh, I moved to the States in the early 70s. My father started the business here in New York, and he opened the first store at the Pierre Hotel in 1972. So I moved as a little girl to the States. We came by boat, we came by ship. It was very dramatic, arriving in New York 10 days later. And um, the, the boutique was a very small boutique with precious jewels. And our, my father really started the expansion outside of Italy, which is our uh, headquartered, um, of the headquarters of the company. The, I should say that the origins of Bulgari are actually Greek. My great-grandfather, uh, Sotirios Bulgaris, was from Greece. And he emigrated to Italy because he thought he would have better business opportunities in Italy. So he took off at the, at the end of the 19th century and started the business in Italy. And then Italianized the name and dropped the S and took away the O. And, it became Bulgari. Anyway, long and short of it, I won't go into a whole history of the company, but my father, at the age of 30, came over to the States and started the business in um, New York, opened the store, brought his you know, three young kids, and um, we were there until 1988. And then uh, the business started to grow. We started expanding around the world, opening more stores. But by 1993, actually, we only had, uh, I think, 21 or 22 stores in the world. and. Um, we made the big move to Fifth Avenue in 1988. At the time, the jewelry sales uh, ritual was very different from what it is today. It was private rooms. It was very intimate. Um, the sales assistants would come out with cubes, and then you'd pull out the trays of jewelry. There was no counters. The counters did not really exist. Tiffany's always had them, but we were always very much more private and sort of intimate. And even in the, uh, a, the store on Fifth Avenue, we had created these rooms alongside this big alleyway. I don't know if any of you remember it, but it's undergone a number of transformations since then. And so um, at the time I was, a, I was selling, I was on the floor selling, and uh, there was talk of entering this new business, diversifying into fragrance. But very generally, like, why don't we create a fragrance that we sell in our stores? And at the time, there was no talk of wholesale distribution. It was just really just a compliment to our jewelry, a beautiful bottle that has a great elegant design. And, and so it all started and the contact with Jean-Claude Elena and this wonderful new fragrance, this new idea, this new concept, and this very unusual oversized bottle. As you can see, this was the original bottle here. 
the eau parfumée or, or thé vert was in this size, 350 ml. You don't see bottles of this size very often. And we were selling it in our 20 stores, and we had the bottle in this little wooden tray, which unfortunately we looked everywhere to see if there was one somewhere in some attic or some basement, but nothing. Um, this little wooden tray, and it had a little space for a, a glass wand, and the cap was just um, glass and glass. And you can see that this is really the designer, uh, Thierry de Bashmakov was 29 when he, when he um, created this bottle. And he was actually trained as an engineer and industrial uh, designer. And he went into perfumery bottle design sort of by accident. And this was his big first project. And uh, it, it was a great, a great opportunity for him. Anyway, it's, as you can see, nothing that really references a jewel. It's not about a jewel, it's about an elegant design, it's about a sculptural piece, it's about proportion and dimension. And here, for example, you have this contrast of the clear glass with the frosted glass. And so the clients would come and you know, look at our jewelry and then there'd be this little tray with this big bottle and, and the salesperson would you know, generally invite them to try the fragrance and they'd wand it and dab it on. And you know, the reaction was instantly wonderful and it really appealed to men and women we always called it a sort of shared fragrance. It was never marketed as a women's fragrance or a men's fragrance, and it is absolutely a shared fragrance. And so from then on, with the, with the success of this fragrance, we ended up actually setting up a proper fragrance division in the company. We did not license it out to a, a known company like Estee Lauder or L'Oreal. We actually did it in-house. And in the last 20 years, we've developed a complete line of fragrances, but completely in-house, briefing different perfumers around the world and, and uh, getting different perfumes developed. But in terms of the design of the bottle, the concept of the fragrance, the line, it's all been done completely in-house. And we, we feel very strongly that our fragrance is a wonderful complement to our jewelry. And, um, and now it's, you know, it's in distribution all over the world and it's obviously not just sold in our stores. Now we have about 250 stores around the world. So it's, the business has grown a lot in 20 years. And um, the fragrance is a huge part of it. It's now about 40% of, uh, not 40, I'm sorry, 25% of the global business. And you had told me, and you had told me something that, you know, when it, when it was being developed, it was interesting talking to you because you had not, I mean, nobody at Bulgari had had training in perfume, of course. Right. Why did you select this as opposed to others? We, we just loved its, um, subtlety, but at the same time, it ha it's a very distinctive flavor fragrance, but it's very subtle. It's very elegant. It's luminous. It's luminous. And it just, it was coming out of actually the decade of the 80s, which were very heavy fragrances. Yes. Uh, the poisons of the world, the, you know, Radically you different. can talk about that yeah. in more depth, but it was a, a decade filled with very, very heavy, overpowering, you know, that would leave like the trail. Right. And this was all about Sorry, I mean, I'm, I, I love them, but this was a, just a new concept, and we, 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 we liked the sort of unassuming elegance of it. Yeah. I, I, I should say, I mean, that's very interesting. Opium was 77, Seven. and... That's a fantastic fragrance. I mean. It's beautiful, it's absolutely beautiful, yeah. And people, I, I think people malign opium <clears throat> today because you're, you're almost supposed to, because, oh, you say, oh, you know, this sort of thing. Well, Nobody, I mean, you should never wear opium in the dosage that they wore in 1977. It's ridiculous, you know. Pour it on. <laughs> yeah. You just put a little on and right. that's it. And I actually had lunch next to a woman at a restaurant on, uh, actually right near the bookery store. And I finally had to turn to her. I was with a, a, a friend of mine. I finally had to turn to her. I said, what are you wearing? She said, opium. And she had dosed it like perfectly. that. Perfectly. Yeah, perfect. So it was just like. It was absolutely beautiful. It was absolutely beautiful. But it was an era, in, in that era, that was unusual. Oh. You put on four times that much. Um, Georgia Beverly Hills, 91. Right. No, is 81, 81, and Poison, 85. Right. And they were huge, and they were meant to be huge. I think Poison is actually spectacular. What, what is extraordinary about this is that Jean-Claude was going in a completely different direction, and he, I, I, I want to stress this, he took this to tons of different people. He's in France. And so no one pay, paid attention to Nobody. Him. And, nobody, and, and they, they couldn't would, really understand it because it was such a new concept. Right. Because it was just out of the realm of what they knew. They couldn't categorize it also in terms of scent type, like an oriental or a floral. They couldn't. It do, and it's not, it's out of every category. 
which is why I put it in luminism. I mean, that's the category for it. And there are luminous painters, uh, uh, which are very, very well known. And there is a, and it's the use of light. As a matter of fact, there's two different kinds of luminous. The first luminous were uh, uh, related to the Hudson River School um, in the late 1800s. And then there were other luminous, which were Dutch luminous, which I had never heard of. And when I started doing the show, I did a, a show in Olfactory Art at the Museum of Arts and Design, and I started looking into this. And I think I have a pretty good art history background. I had never heard of them, and they're absolutely beautiful. And they play with light. And this scent, what, what Jean-Claude was doing was playing with light. And I don't know if you were, if you guys were conscious of this, and this may be, it would sound really good if you said, Probably oh, not. absolutely, yeah, absolutely. But it- Like it, the facets of a stone. The facets of a stone and the way right. light hits a jewel. I mean, a jewel is about the interaction of light. If you have a jewel in the dark, you can have music in pitch dark. You can have right. perfume in the dark too. It is absolutely 100% what it is. This medium, you know, the, the, I mean, you, you know, jewels, you have to be, they have to be lit and the light, hits them and it goes, so it's perfect. I was thinking, should we pass the bottle around so that everyone can try it? Because it's like so abstract that- Is it? It's no, not it's filled, not in right? this one, no. Oh. It's so abstract that I think it's important as we're talking to maybe to just pass it around. Just spray it, it's a spray, yeah. And I gotta tell, I wanna tell the story about uh, the reason for the size. Yeah, oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So the, the reason for this size, Thierry, so I've known Thierry for a long time. He's actually a cousin of Jean-Claude, which is- That was completely sort of accidental. Completely right? accidental. Yeah. And it was very funny because he had, he had come in and you know, you said that he was trained as an engineer and he was very bored with engineering. And he was, industrial design or- Yeah, 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 and industrial design. Right. And so he was doing these, and he was doing these houses, sort of prefab houses, they weren't quite that bad, but they were in the south of France. He got really bored with it and he would see Jean-Claude at these, you know, family events. And Jean-Claude said, well, look, why don't you get into bottle design? He said, because, you know, I look at the bottles and sometimes they're not, you know, you have a real feel for this. And so he went to Paris, he set himself up and he had no training in it at all. And they had chosen, you guys had chosen the Jews by chair. They were looking around for, for a bottle. And they didn't want to, we didn't want to go with one of the big players. Exactly. We wanted to do something a little bit off the beaten track. And they didn't want, and you didn't want to do a jewel, which I thought was great. Right. Because you could have done this you know, this, this big bottle, it was supposed to look like a jewel and it would have been, I think, extremely kitsch. And they wanted something that was extremely pure to hold this very pure scent. And they found Thierry. And what was, what was funny about Thierry was he went in, he met with Bulgari. The Bulgari team said, yeah, great, give us something, which is extraordinary freedom yeah. and a huge amount of trust. And so he went back and he, he perceived, you know, the cologne, the, the, the column, excuse me, and, and these sides. And by the way. This decollete. Yeah, well, okay. But that, he told me that that is actually, that's actually not. This looks like well, a perfect neck around which to put the jewels. Yeah, he but says, it's abstracted. No, it's not literal. Right, and a lot of people, and I've said to, in, in their, you know, people were writing magazines and this kind of thing. Oh, yes, this was absolutely brilliant because you know, you wear the diamonds around this like a necklace. He said, no, nobody ever thought about that. He said, I didn't even think about that. You know, he said, I just wanted a pure form, a column that was sliced and two. Right. And what was very funny was that, and who, who was the, um, I'm forgetting the name of the Bulgari who was uh, heading the team. Gianluca Brudetti. So Brazetti no, asked. Oh, my, my uncle, Paolo? It must have been, yeah, it must have been your uncle. Paolo, yeah. It must, and he said, Paolo, and there were, there were two other uh, people who were with him, and they, that was the team. And today you get, you know, 50 people on a team. It's ridiculous. Right. And you well, yeah, but we were, just yeah. we were just starting. You know, and concept. no focus grouping and none of this, right. you know. No yeah. focus grouping, true. We just yeah. said, okay, we'll go with that. Right? Yeah, yeah, which. Nowadays, that does not happen. But not only nowadays, even then they were focus grouping. They no. started focus grouping in the 1970s. And you guys were just sort of, you know, here we are. You know, we kind of, it was kind of a gamble, but at the end of the day, it was, it was, we were trying something completely new. It was very limited in its sort of, you know, distribution, and therefore we could take a little bit of a gamble. You could take a risk, yeah. Yeah, and we just really wanted to be impassioned about what, what we were putting out there. And Jean-Claude, by the way, said to me. It wasn't just about having a success. It was about having something we were really proud of in this new category that, yeah. we had had no experience in. And he said to me that it was very, very strange for him as a, as, a, as a perfumer because usually it was, okay, give us this, now give us that, now we want more, we want it heavier, we want more floral, we want like this sort of thing. Like complete freedom. Right, it was complete freedom for him, which, yeah. it, which he said was both wonderful and sort of unnerving, I think. And, um, but he believed in it 100%, so he was thrilled you know, that you took it. And so two stories, the first one was that, that you had taken it and it was supposed to be this just in the stores, and they got a call from New York, and of course he hears about this as a perfumer. They got a call from New York and they said, 
It had just come out. I don't know if it was a matter of weeks. And the, the, the person in the United States, you know, calling on the line said, We're out of stock. We, we're out of stock. We can't keep it in stock. So this, this bottle was um, sold only in the stores, I'll just repeat that, and it was $125. At the time, it's like the equivalent of, I would say, $250, Three, $300. Yeah, $300. It was an expensive you know, bottle, 4% concentration, right? I don't, I don't. They are, yeah, 4%. Is it 4%? Yeah. What's interesting is that, you know, when we were working on this, I was talking to, to Givadon, and I've actually, I've done, um, I've used it in scent dinners. I do these scent dinners, and it's beautiful because it has these wonderful gourmand aspects to it. And, the re and that's the reason I know this, because I was talking to Givadon about it. I said, well, look, can you send me this bottle and, and this bottle and 50 ml and this sort of thing? And they said, well, you know, okay, because they're used to this. And when, it came, <laughs> but when, it, well, when it came to Tever, they sort of hesitated. And I said, what? They said, it's a really expensive juice. And, and so they hesitated a little bit about that. Um, the other story is that the reason for this is that Paolo said to, so, and, and this was the yeah, first yeah. meeting, the yeah. first meeting, so he says to Terry, um, come in and we want you to, we want you to do a, we want a big bottle. We want 250 ml, which is already huge. Because yeah, the are, average is 100. 100 is the biggest size, generally, that you find on the market. Well, 150. There's always 100 and there's almost always a 50. And 50, right. Yes. Right, right. So, okay. So he said 250. So Terry's doing his bottle and he's sketching it out. And here's this industrial engineer and industrial designer. He sort of does his thing. And then he creates the bottle. He creates the mock-up. And he's just about... I think it was you know, 24 hours before the thing, and he realizes that his calculations are wrong, and he's created a mock-up for a 350 ml bottle. And he actually called Powell and he said, oh my god, you know, Mr. Bulgari, I'm so sorry, I don't know, this sort of thing. And when he saw it, he was like, ah, it's fine. Yeah, no, he said, he said it's wonderful. <laughs> Heck, he said, another 100 ml, no problem. Yeah, he said, this is, he said, well, I can redo it, I can redo it. And he said, no, this is what we want. So an extraordinary amount of scent. One thing I think is very important, I've said this uh, to you several times, this was not created, you said it was unisex, but this was created with absolutely with, with no, no gender. gender in mind right. at okay. all. I, I, I don't like the word unisex. It's, no, it's stupid. It's, but, what is it, unisex? I mean, what's... Well, the yeah. perfumers hate it. I was actually in, no. in, in Jean-Claude Garden one time in, 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 in Grasse, we were talking about this, and he is thrilled that Bulgari did not put any gender on this. And he said, you know, he thought, oh God, it's going to be a feminine. It's going to be feminine because it's light. It's going to be feminine because it's clear. It's going to be feminine because you know the jewels are bought for women and then all this sort of thing. And they and, and they didn't do it. And he was astounded that you didn't do it. And I said to him, he 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 actually said to me, um, he said, "What is you know a work by Brahms?" He said, "Is that for women or for men?" He said, "Nobody would look at a Picasso and say, okay, that's for men and Ravel is for women. It's just stupid." And he said, "We, but he can't. They can't say that in public." Well, because it's all about marketing. Right. It's all about you have the marketing. To, you know, target your audience, but. This is a shared, ungendered fragrance. Yeah, he was, he was thrilled with this. By the way, we want uh, any questions. You're yeah, welcome you to come up. Yeah, you can start sort of asking questions, interrupting us, because our conversation is very. I love Brochette's fragrance. Oh, that's so, I love, I mean, people are loyal to it. But the why My mom is here, and it's her favorite perfume, too, by the way. Yeah. It just. Oh. oh, really? The raw materials, perfumer raw materials are made, and, and this is, I want to be very clear about this, they are all tested. It costs you about $250,000, quarter of a million dollars or more to bring a new uh, raw material, both a natural and a synthetic, to market. So this is, and I've heard people say, and really believe, they say, oh, this work, this perfume is so wonderful because it works with my uh, hormones. I'm, I'm a woman and it works with my female hormones and I bought it masculine for my husband and it works with his hormones. I said, you know, if it's working, interacting with your hormones, then you know, the <laughs> FDA is not doing its job and it would be illegal by definition. It can't do that. It would be a medicine. You know, it would be a drug. It's ridiculous. But there are differences in pH balance on skin and there are differences in um, diet. In diet, yeah, diet plays a part in it. But, but it's, 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 you know, it but, doesn't matter about the finest perfume, 
And you just can't wear it. It just. But you can wear this. She can wear this. There's one, I mean, there's one molecule that I remember specifically. Jean-Claude was talking about it. And it's a beautiful molecule, and it's called uh, methyl dihydrojasmonate. And you can tell by the name that it came from jasmine. It's a molecule that exists naturally in jasmine. Try to spell that now. <laughs> methyl dihydrojasmonate. Does that help? Jasmine. Exactly, exactly. So it exists naturally in jasmine, and it's absolutely beautiful. But what's interesting is it does not smell like jasmine. I think that's very, very important. I'm actually, you're not supposed to say this, I'm actually not a huge fan of jasmine. And I'm certainly not a fan of non-engineered jasmine because jasmine has a hugely animalic quality to it. And animalic? Animalic, yeah. Like animal. Like animal. Like It smells like armpit. I've never heard that before. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's very important. Jasmine and uh, orange blossom. And they smell like there's this quality of armpit to them. If you don't, and this is one of the reasons that they don't, and they do an essence of jasmine rather than absolute because the essence takes more of the top notes. Methyl, somebody described this. I think it was Luca Turin, actually, who said this to me. Pouring in methyl dihydrojasmonate, it's actually very difficult. You never smelled it by itself. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll get you some. I'll send you some, actually, because Great. it's fascinating. Can't, can't wait. It's beautiful. <laughs> it's beautiful. But what's interesting is it doesn't, when you smell it, you can, it's barely perceptible. Okay. When you pour it into a perfume, and Eleanor used a good amount of it in this, he said it is the equivalent of at pouring in liquid halogen light. And he said, you don't so much smell it as you perceive it. And its impact is on all the other uh, materials. Right. And it just lights this it thing up It kind of catalyzes or just elucidates all the other ones. Yeah, no, yeah, exactly. So would you want to stabilize No, no, not, absolutely not stabilizing. It illuminates. But when you say you've really tried a lot of, I mean, have you really tried a lot of different kinds of scents from floral to? And is it you that doesn't like how it smells, or do you actually? It actually is great. It does not smell the same. In other words, it smells like, you know, I was but you know, fragrance, you know, fragrance has sort of a process, so it has like a dry down, and it's going to be smelling differently. It smells like grapes. It smells like Belgian grapes. All of them. Um, yeah. You. I, I'm sure I told you this. Jean-Claude said to me that he has been told several times by Japanese, you know, the Japanese don't have any history whatsoever, and it actually does very well in Japan. And he said the reason why, he, said, he, he has been told by several Japanese people that this is the perfect scent for eating sushi. Because it's not, dis it's, oh, interesting, it's not disruptive to. It's not. Sushi is, J Japanese aesthetic is extremely purified. It's absolutely is the most purified aesthetic that I have, that I know. It's the exact opposite of France, which is you pour it all in. You put gold on top of satin that's dark red, and you put you know all this stuff. And he said this is the exact opposite. It comes from a French perfumer, but it's just purified. And sushi, really well-made sushi, you have one slice of just the perfect. You have rice. It's Everything is minimalist too. Yeah, it's minimalist and it's simple. And I think that that's the reason. There's very much an I don't. I don't know if you're conscious of this, but there's very much an Asian aesthetic in this, which I oh, think is completely. fascinating. Absolutely. And also the whole tea component, the tea ritual that you right. find in Japan. And so since Eau Parfumé, though, we actually kind of created a family of tea fragrances, tea concepted fragrances. Uh, the women's fragrance, the Pour Femmes, uh, beautiful. We didn't bring them all, but that's Jasmine Sambac. And then a men's fragrance, that's a Darjeeling tea. And yeah. We had a lovely fragrance for mothers and children called Petit and Maman which we still sell here and there. And um, that was chamomile based. So it was a whole, t it was a whole, it's not my phone. It was a whole, it was a whole family of fragrances with this sort of tea story. And the red tea, I think I told you this, I have a buddy who's a corporate lawyer with Chevron and everywhere he goes, he stockpiles red tea. Oh, that's, buys it on. the people who love that one, is, they're yeah, crazy. It's, it's right. extraordinary. It's, yeah, it's not as widely distributed. Anymore. And this is a guy's guy, okay? And he will go to, and he goes to Dubai regularly for, obviously, he goes to the Middle East, and, and you can find it there. And he grabs the last five bottles, and he puts it in his bag, and he said, it pisses me off because then I have to check a bag, but the, he'll check the bag. Right. I don't Just know what he does. Red tea. Yeah, he has every, and he, and, he, and he puts it on, I think he yeah. puts it in the fridge, and he, you know, and I don't know, he's desperate for it. Great.
It's amazing. All of these, I just want to show you a little bit the, the product line. These uh, small sizes are actually, we ended up doing a line extension. So um, bath gels, soaps, uh, shampoo, conditioner, and body lotion. And since 2000, let me think for a second, about 1998, 2000, we have actually um, uh, had a distribution of these products in hotels, in high-end hotels, Four Seasons, The Ritz. And it's been unbelievably successful. Also, it's been sort of a, you know, a way to get the scent out um, and um, market it without advertising it. And uh, there's just an incredible following. I remember back in uh, the early 2000s, the Four Seasons on 57th Street, there was a little counter. I haven't been there in a while, but there was a little counter, and people would stay in the rooms, try the scent, and then we'd have full-size product for sale so that people you know, could just react on their enthusiasm and buy it right then and there. So, and it's still widely um, distributed. I, I can't remember how many hotels we have it in now, but I, I think a few hundred around the world. It's not. I was just, just in one in Europe. I don't even remember the hotel, three, but I remember that. 400 hotels around the world. That they were in there, yeah. So. And I took a bunch of the bath gels and stuck them this in This was luggage. a great uh, product, and I'm going to open it. This was called an Oshibori, which was really? um, a Japanese name for a little scented towelette. And this was great. These were, you've seen this, no? No, I, I have, that I've never oh, seen. There you go. Clean your hands. Here. All right. And then this here um, is actually a tea bag, which you can actually put in your, in your bath. So it scents and it colors your bath water. Quite lovely. It colors it in the green. Yeah. In the Tavare yep. green. This is just a bath soap. This is a candle that we have burning here. What is this? This is just lotion. Um, if some people, because it's such high, a low concentration, some people say, you know, it doesn't stay with me as long as I would like it. So often what, what a perfumer or someone who is in the business will tell you is that the best thing to do is to layer it. So shower with, with the gel and then put the lotion and then the fragrance and you'll have a little bit more of a long-lasting effect. Right, yeah. Did you personally Yeah, 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 totally. Can you talk? Yeah, I can talk. They, yeah, it's a very big <laughs> distinction. Yeah, well, it's okay, but, he, but here's the thing. Look, there... Do you know that none of these categories actually uh, really exist? Do you know the reason, or, 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 or to be more precise, well, so they have a cologne, eau de cologne, eau de toilette, um, eau de parfum, eau parfum, and parfum. parfum. So those and do you know what they were? In gradation, the different concentrations. Do you know what they are? Do you know where they originated? They originated in France <clears throat> in the 16th century, excuse me, in the 1600s. When people didn't bathe very much. But as a way to get around the tax on alcohol. That's the reason they exist. I didn't know that. Yes. Nobody does. And people think, oh, there's some sort of formula by this. Or it's completely, well, now it's become a marketing thing. And well, that's but fine. Now, but it wasn't and, and a marketing thing. now generally an eau de toilette will have like a 10 or 12% concentration of fragrance. It depends. There's, I mean, it there's varies. There's no guide. It varies hugely. It varies hugely. But they were ways to get around uh, the uh, king's tax on alcohol. And they would just create these categories. But here's something that's very, very import important. <clears throat> Look. There is no difference between men's and women's. It's ridiculous. If you really want to wear something, you know what you do? You go out and you just try it on. And anybody who knows about perfume, you just go. And, and remember that in French, parfum is parfum. There's not this. Uh, there is an eau de Cologne. Eau de Cologne, which comes from Cologne, from the city, is a very specific scent. It is a mix of citrus, bitter orange, lemon. You might have verbena in there, which is an herb. You have other herbals. Um, grapefruit and so on. Uh, the most expensive ones in the world, by the way, come from uh, southern Italy. And they're very good quality from Florida, which is sort of just below. And they have a lot of citrus actually from the Ivory Coast. And like Acqua di Parma. Acqua di Parma, Wouldn't yeah. that be one of them? I mean, I'm sure that Acqua di Parma is, you know, they're using the very expensive stuff. Right. Um, and that's what it is. It's a citrus blend with some aromatics, some herbs. That's an actual cologne. But that wasn't for men or women either. It's just marketing. The United States, they have tried to give heterosexual men psycho-emotional permission to wear scent. So they said, oh, this is a cologne, and this is a perfume. You know, because there's no cult, but we don't have a culture in the, in the Anglo-Saxon. That's true. We have no culture of wearing scent. And you don't have to do that, and they don't do that, by the way, in France and in Italy. 
You don't have to do that. And you wear, wear what you want. Wear whatever's good. I think we become less sort of limited by those categories in the States, too. I guess. I don't know. Because it, it bums me out because people will say to me, oh, you know, Ode Vera. And people say to me, what do you wear? And I will sort of list them. And I will list Ode Vera. And they say, oh, you wear women's scents. You wear women's perfume. Really? I said, yeah, yeah. And I, I said, well, I don't. I mean, they so, you know, it's bulgari. And they sort of, I don't know, they associate it with, uh, you know. And they call it a perfume. And then you're like, oh, God, just, just wear it. Just wear the stuff. It, yes, what I mean by that is all art. I'm not talking about perfume. I'm saying art must be artificial. Painting, architecture, sculpture, music, dance, literature. Art has to have the quality of being artificial because it has to have a person, the artist, behind it who says, I am going to make you feel this, OK? Um, it was interesting because I did a piece for, and actually I, I thought of this for the first time, I did a piece for Gourmet when Ruth Reichel was running it. And um, the guy I wrote The Ember of Sin about, Luca Turin, he, he was the one that I got the idea of doing sin criticism from. And I don't think that anybody had ever done this. He wrote a book called uh, Parfum Le Guide, a Guide to Perfume. And you know, he, he would treat these as the works of art that they actually are. And Ruth loved it. She read the book. She loved the book. And she sent us to, um, uh, I can't remember the name of it right now. It's a region in uh, southwest uh, France. And they make these vin doux moelleux and these sweet white wines, and they're wonderful. But they're not dessert wines. They're wines, but they have a higher uh, sugar content. They're beautiful. So we went there. I wrote the piece. I turned it in, and she said, well, the piece is wonderful, but he doesn't do any criticism of wine. And he loves wine, you know? And he talks about some of the perfumes and those he criticized. But and I, I called him. I, she said, well, why not? I said, well, I, I don't know. I don't know. He just didn't do it. I didn't write it down because he didn't do it. She said, well, this is very important. So I called him up. He lived in London. I called him up, and I said, you didn't write any criticism of wine. He said, hmm, I never thought about that. And yet we were doing wine the whole time. He said, let me think about it. So he, he calls me back 24 hours later, and he says, what I realized is the difference between these, wine is not a work of art. Wine is a work of nature, or it certainly should be. If it's DOAC, it should be a work of nature. It should be this terroir and this rain and this varietal in this year. Right. And that's why you have a millésime, all right? Because you have, you have a year. And everything changes. Scents are not supposed to change. They are made as works of art. This is not supposed to vary. And there are naturals in this. Well, but they're not supposed to, to, to change with the natural. This is a work of art. It needs to stay that. Just as a painting, you wouldn't vary a painting every year, according to your mood. You know, that's the work. And this is a great, great work of art. And in that sense, that's what I was, was, was talking about. Keep it in the fridge. Keep it in the fridge. <laughs> yeah. Well, the light, the light will affect a fragrance with such low concentration. The three things, the three worst things uh, for fragrance are um, heat. heat. Light is the, actually the worst, and heat, and also, you know what? Variations in temperature. You don't want to get hot and cold and hot and cold. People store it in the bathroom, where it's usually flooded with light, and it's and there's a lot of heat. And the worst thing is that you know, take a shower, it goes up, it goes down. If you really want to keep it, store it in the fridge. I have tons of my my fridges. The first two things, and the and all and the crispers are filled with perfume. Yeah. What's that? No, it stays. Yeah, I take it out and I put it on and I put it back. Well, you know, this fragrance is actually, uh, I think, multi-generational, multicultural. Uh, it's kind of, it, it's a mm. universal fragrance. It appeals, I really can't say that there is a typology of person or age group that it appeals to. And it appeals in the Far East, it appeals in, right? Yeah, Would absolutely. Would you say it's really absolutely. very universal? That's a good question. It's difficult to use. People want to use perfumes as sort of Rorschach tests to diagnose personality. I don't, I'm not sure that it does. But what's interesting about this fragrance is that f 
for its followers, they are diehards. It's like, that, this is my go-to fragrance. And it's not because I'm carrying the name and I have to be wearing it. It's my go-to sort of fragrance for the last 20 years. I, I try other fragrances. I have you know, more of an evening fragrance. Or, but this is my go-to everyday fragrance. And I'm just fond of its luminosity. No. You know, I, I just, I, I put it on and I just, it gives me this great, I don't know. And you know what's interesting? I don't think I told you this. You know, I did a piece on, for the New York Times on Sarah Jessica Parker and her uh, oh, creating. Oh, her developing her fragrance? Yeah, her developing her fragrance. And it was very, very interesting. And she told me that she had been good friends with Brooke Shields. And Brooke gave her a bottle of, I think it was Joy. Mm -hmm. And her mother immediately took it away from her. And she said, you know, you couldn't have this skinny 11-year-old girl wearing Joy. And Joy's a very, very sort of. Joy, yeah, Joy's gorgeous. I mean, it's absolutely yeah, amazing. But it's, but it's an older fragrance. It's, well, it didn't used to be. When it came out, it certainly wasn't. Addressing an old, I see it as an older, no? Not when it emerged. It emerged, in, it, it was launched in 1933. And it was That's absolutely, true. it was, you know, young and all this sort of thing. What's interesting about Eau de Tevere is I have talked to a lot of mothers who say this is the first perfume I gave to my daughter. And it wasn't, it's not something that goes, it, it's not, it, you know, these perfumes are supposed to be sexual and they're supposed to be this sort of thing. And they can be. I mean, they're, you know, they're made for this and they're made to make big statements, this sort of thing. You don't want your daughter necessarily to be making those statements. Right. And they will give this, because a lovely scent, you know, everybody likes it. Mm -hmm. It's universally acceptable. And, and it's it, not threatening. It's not, it's not threatening. It doesn't, it doesn't transmit a message. And remember that, you know, perfume is the most portable form of intelligence. And you're really talking to people when you wear this. And I think this is extremely high IQ in a very, very subtly elegant way. Are we, we're out of time? Not for the green tea. We don't do it for the green tea. We do it for the poor om fragrances that we have. Just use the yeah, just use the scent. The green tea. Use the scent. Yeah, you could just use the scent and even the body lotion. A little bit of the body lotion. It's yeah. Well, if you look, I mean, we talked about we talked about opium, and opium is not is is obviously opaque. It is meant to be opaque. It is meant to have a dense construction. Um, talk about the er, you know the the pre war perfumes. Fraca, uh, Giki. That, but yeah, but it's very particular. Yeah, it's it's very particular, and it's making very Burrows, much. Yeah. And the difference is that actually Frederick Mall. I think that you can. I think that there is both there. It both emanates light from it in an olfactory way. Obviously, you're not like putting little LED diodes on it. Although we could try that. Maybe a special. What do you think, Dana? We can do uh, next year. We can do LEDs. Uh, sometimes someone is wearing a fragrance, and you, and you're very conscious of them wearing the fragrance at all times. It's like it's, it's just right there. That person fragrance. This I think will come in in like waves. Like you'll smell it a moment, and then it will be gone. It's like there's. It's much more sort of undulating, and yeah. it 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 espouses the person without being like without clinging. I can't explain it. Well, there was one. Yes, I mean, I think that there is, I think that it is, it is light in the sense of it's, it's luminous on you. I think that it lifts you. I think that it makes you open. I don't think it closes you off. And it doesn't, and it doesn't also, um, it doesn't set up a wall around you. And there are ones that are meant to. And opium, for example, is meant to. Opium was meant to make a statement. You went in there, and here was this thing. But Frederick Mall said to me, um, the difference between them, and he wasn't, he, he, he was talking about Jean-Claude's work, mm -hmm. because you know Jean-Claude is created for him. And in his case, he was talking about L'Eau d'Hiver, but he said all of Jean-Claude's work carries this, and this is certainly true of Eau de Tevere Bulgari. Um, in the case of opium and other perfumes like that, you wear the scent. No, sorry, sorry, sorry. The scent wears, wears you. you. That's, yes. And you carry it around like a diamond. Now, obviously, Bulgari has no problem with that, because, you know, that's what you know, it's, 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 core business. But yeah. Yeah, right, that's your business. So you, you carry these things around, but they make a statement like this. And it's very interesting that as a jewelry company, you would choose something where the scent actually disappears into you and becomes part of you. It's not exterior. You don't show off your perfume. The perfume becomes part of you. I don't know, maybe that's perfect for Bulgari because you actually sell the jewels, the jewelry company. And this is something that accompanies it. 
right. it doesn't take away from the jewelry. As a matter of fact, and if anything, it enha I think it's not it enhances in competition. It. It's it's just. There you go. Very good. All right, yeah.